Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 311, cover dated April 1994. So the cover caption to stalk a saber tooth, cover featuring Bishop going up against a very vicious looking saber tooth and the art by John Romita Jr. inked by Al Vey. And this happens to be John Romita Jr.'s final issue of his second short run on the title. And I'll talk a little bit more about what happened there when I uh, open up the comic to the splash page. So we've got a very cool splash page here featuring the beast upside down in some funky, we'll see that when I turn over the pages, some funky designed uh, John Romita Jr. Uh, battle armor or a containment suit, whatever way you want to uh, interpret it. And the art here by Romita Jr. but inked by Dan Green. And what happened was Romita Jr. after this issue uh, took a leave of absence to work on the special Punisher Batman Marvel DC Comics crossover from 1994. And Bob Harris, the editor, had to find obviously fill-in artists. And the, the next up artist to guest on Uncanny X-Men for the next two issues was none other than Joe Madureira. And the story goes that the fan mail coming in from Madureira and the huge reaction to his work on issues 312 and 313 convinced Bob Harris to basically hand the Uncanny X-Men penciler gig to Madureira. And so when Romita Jr. came back expecting to continue on the title, Bob Harris basically said that his uh, services were no longer required. And uh, John Romita Jr. was not at all happy about that. So, let's see, where is the beast? Well, it's one of these trademark, gotta turn it over uh, to the side here so that you can see this double page spread. The beast is upside down in this armor containment suit while he's working away on the Shi'ar tech in uh, the X-Mansion. And a uh, very cool combination of uh, open art for the colorist Steve Buccellato and Marie Javins credited for colors, but uh, these colors on this page, uh, double page spread is definitely by Buccellato. So the creative team there, or rather the title of the story is putting the cat out. So that cat in question will be Sabretooth. And the creative team there, Scott Lobdell, writer, John Romita Jr., penciler, Dan Green, and Alve Inkers. I'll point out uh, the part of the issue where Alve takes over. Chris Eliopoulos letters, and as I said earlier, uh, Steve Buccellato and Marie Javins uh, colors. So Jubilee is looking to go to the cinema for a midnight showing of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And uh, she is miffed that Beast is taking way too long at what he's doing. So what happens now is that Iceman happens by and he says, uh, cut the throw rug some slack, Jay. That's the beast. On the list of the X-Men's priorities, maintaining the integrity of the mansion's central energy matrix is just a little bit more important than a night out at the local cineplex babysitting. So Jubilee is surprised at Bobby's appearance and then she gets an idea. Good old Bobby Drake, good old bestest Bobby Drake, good old bestest reliable. So Beast figures out that she's looking to uh, switch and get Bobby to take her to the cinema. So Bobster, what do you say? If you lend me 20 bucks, I'll even treat. Wow, what an offer. But sorry, after the executioner's attempted assault on the White Queen, that was the previous issue, Professor Xavier has asked that the security be beefed up around the med lab. Yeah, so do it when we come back. Some of us has responsibilities, says Iceman. And uh, Jubilee says, spoken like somebody who hasn't had a date in a month. What's that? Don't think I missed that crack about babysitting either, she says. And then the beast is just continuing working on the Shi'ar central energy matrix. Almost done, yeah, right. Then you'll probably have to shed or something. So Lobdell, always very good, uh, writing Jubilee. Definitely one of the best writers uh, to capture her particular uh, style of humor and um, her style of dialogue as well. Uh, fresh, it hasn't dated. Her voice hasn't dated at all in 30 years. So really good work by him. And um, also a pretty comic dynamic between uh, Jubilee and Iceman throughout uh, Lobdell's run as well. But something serious is gonna happen to Iceman a little later in this issue that will have long-term ramifications. So then we switch to several hundred feet outside the warmth and safety of the mansion walls. 
The man called Bishop finds a certain comfort in the whipping winds and silent fury of the snowstorm that has blanketed much of Westchester County this evening. So remember, uh, Scott and Jean's wedding um, has just taken place and it took place in January. So it's the middle of winter uh, in the storyline. And Bishop is the mansion's chief security officer. But what's he doing? What's he about out here um, in the winter uh, landscape? And so he thinks to himself, still recall the first time I tried this. My sister and I were tracking down an M plate off the coast of Maine, only to discover it had cornered us. She was nearly eviscerated. I'd completely depleted my bio energy power and the two of us were freezing huddled together in an open field with no cover in sight. Anyone else would have quietly bled to death, but not shard. Think about it, Bishop, she said. When the snow hits our bodies, it melts, releasing energy. Not much, no, but multiply that a thousand times. And I wound up with enough power to obliterate our target when it finally arrived. And he thinks very quietly, I miss you, sister. And that's very reminiscent of um, Ali Blair Dazzler in uh, Mark Silvestri's first issue, Uncanny X-Men 218, where she had been presumed dead by Juggernaut in the previous issue and he buried her under a cairn of stones in the earth and she was fully depleted of her power and she used the ambient sounds, the teeny tiny ambient sounds to uh, charge up her powers. Bishop doing something comparable here and I wonder did Lobdell get the idea for this from reading uh, Uncanny X-Men 218. And then we've got a couple of silent panels as a figure in mostly silhouette walks towards Bishop from behind, and there he is, he's alert. Hello, Aurora. So it's Storm, very cool artwork here and combination of art and coloring, capturing the nighttime uh, light as well. And again, I think that that's Buccellato's colors. Love the art and color on this page as well. So Storm here, and she says she's impressed. She didn't think she'd made a sound. And he says as he's covered in snow, you didn't, but then I wouldn't be much used to the X-Men if I were so easy, easily ambushed. So Storm is worried that he's gonna catch pneumonia. Is there something he wants to discuss? Not really Storm, just relating as best I can. So she asks him to snow. It is one of the few constants in my life, even in the future, that which was gives way to something different. I've decided Bobby was right. At Cyclops bachelor party, previous issue, he told me I was living in the past. It is time now to start living in the moment for the moment is all we ever truly have. So Aurora decides he's fine. She bids him good night. She's heading into the city to meet up with Gambit and an old friend. So she tells him, "Stay good night, Bishop, stay out of trouble. Of course, Storm, he smiles to himself. He knows he shouldn't do it. What's he about to do? He flings a snowball after her and she just easily uh, dodges around it. So he's there smiling to himself. If not for the fact she's always so serious, Storm reminds me so much of Shard. Though of course Aurora lacks my sister's playfulness and sense of, and then he's just a massive uh, pile of snow dumped on him. And he has um, a laugh there because Storm isn't of course without a sense of humor, yes. Really great uh, couple of pages by John Romita Jr. Great combination of the pencils, the storytelling, the inks and the colors. So Bishop ends up laughing there, mouth open. And then we've got, that's an interesting transition then to uh, Sabretooth who's also got his mouth open, but he's not laughing as the roar of laughter echoes off the courtyard walls and altogether a different howl violates the deepest recesses of the mansion, Xavier. It is a sound of rage and fury of a life spent soaked in the blood of strangers, of a mind twisted almost since birth by constant pain and confusion. So we get a little explanation of uh, Sabretooth's situation and the fact that without that sonic glow, um, he is going absolutely crazy murderously crazy in his cell and just look at the sweat dripping off him as well um really great work by Ramita jr on these pages and panels and the narrative captions say that today for example has not been one of his better days his mind in flames his guts caught in a grip of ice the only coherent thought that Sabretooth has is to wait wait for the moment he can be free wait until he can stalk once again Wait until he can take his revenge on those who have placed him here. Now, he volunteered for it, right? He asked Professor X for help. So he's partly to blame for his situation indeed. And then we switch to MedLab. And we've got Bobby here taking care of uh, 
the systems that are looking after Emma Frost, the White Queen, in her coma. And he thinks to himself about uh, his uh, empty love life. He had Opal Tanaka and Uber Bay by anyone's definition. And I do everything short of throwing her out a window to keep us apart. Maybe some people just aren't destined to be happy, he thinks. And he looks at Emma there. Take Emma here. Beautiful, powerful. She had it all. And spent so much time flirting with danger as the White Queen. It was only a matter of time before she got hurt. And hurt bad. What a waste. And that was back in Uncanny X-Men 281. So there's a call from um, Jubilee. Who is still um, bothering Beast about taking her to the cinema. And then Beast discovers there's a problem in the central energy matrix. You see... There was no way of knowing the effect Magneto's global electromagnetic burst back in X-Men 25 would have on the Shi'ar technology, although the core itself is untouched. It seems to adversely realigned the failsafes, he thinks. So, in an instant, the entire mansion is plunged into darkness, as if the entire complex has suddenly died. And so it goes dark, and then... Uh, Bobby screams. It is a scream that is torn from somewhere beyond the center of Bobby Drake's soul, caught in the feedback of an alien power surge. There is no way the mutant known as Iceman could have protected himself from the ravages of the bizarre energy which now courses through his body any more than he can protect the heretofore defenseless frame of Emma Frost. To his credit, as an X-Man, as well as, a sim as simply a compassionate human being, he does what he can to defend her helpless form. It is a decision he will come to regret for the rest of his life. So what's happened to him here, we'll discover in subsequent issues of the title. So Beast recognizes as a problem. Jubilee, he asks, is she okay? Is there anybody out there who's there? Well, Bishop, of course. So Bishop says, no, Be storms left for the evening. Is there anything I can help with? I need you down here, stat. The energy core shut down. Indeed, says Bishop. So he's super calm. This is the kind of stuff that Bishop is trained for. And um, Beast Twigs, that his most immediate concern is the fact that the mansion's entire security system is offline. So this is great. This is a great character bit and moment here where um, we're told about Bishop. He's in motion before the Beast utters another word for Bishop realizes the unthinkable has happened. Sabretooth is loose. So he's on his way. And then Jubilee, she's uh, massively nervous and concerned. This is like bogus. She hears a growling behind her. Is it Wolverine? Guess it's too much to hope it's his growl. Not hardly shortcake. So this massive meaty hand that grabs her hair from behind and yanks her. So it's not Logan, of course. Instead, it's Sabretooth. Great anchor image here as Jubilee's uh, glasses fall off. And Sabretooth just yanks her up by the hair. And um, he says, Wolverine can't hear you, kid. He's somewhere licking his wounds, remember? Did you forget? And all the excitement, maybe your Uncle Victor can help you. So she asks him, is he going to kill her? What do you think? And she says, I think you're going to kill me, bingo. I'd give you a prize, but you ain't going to be alive long enough to use it. So Beast knows that there's big trouble out there. And he's thinking, come on, Bishop, come on. And he needs to hurry up himself uh, because uh, the system uh, needs to be fixed. And outside, Bishop is on it. So he thinks to himself, one of the first rules of XSC training is no conversation on an unsecured line. So he doesn't answer back to Beast. The last thing I'd want Sabretooth to know is that I'm tearing my way through the mansion, literally, while absorbing what residual energy I can from the heart of this complex. So he's got a plan, he knows what he's doing, and he's racing down to tackle Sabretooth. So Jubilee's delaying him uh, with a request for um, a, a last request. So Sabretooth says, sure, yeah. And here we go. This is the switch over to Alve on inks. So we see a slightly uh, like a different style, um, inking style here. Um, uh, more detailed in some ways and um, a more controlled line than Dan Green's. So also complimentary uh, or complimenting uh, John Romita Jr's style. Gives it a slightly different look, um, a little bit more of a, a conventional look, I would say. 
um, but nice nonetheless. So it's interesting to get both inkers on this work. Of course, that means along with the two colorists that it, this issue was under a deadline crunch, uh, trying to get it to the printers. That's why uh, there are two inkers and two colorists. In any case, Jubilee hits him with hot plasma bursts, blinds him. He throws her into the wall and she's more or less knocked out. And then just at that moment, Bishop arrives blasting through the wall and he grabs another yank there, grabs Jubilee to pull her away from Sabretooth. And there we go, great anchor image here. So he says to her, listen to me girl, Creed has fled deeper into the mansion. My guess is he'll head for the usually secured entrance to the Morlock tunnels. So Bishop thinking all the time about what Sabretooth might do, but the power down, he'll escape into the tunnels, uh, says Jubilee. We'd never find him, he'd be out there somewhere. That's why we're going to stop him, Bishop says. So I only have so much stored energy, my body will have to split up and, but she's not up for it. She's completely traumatized. So she doesn't want to be left alone. And she just hugs him and cries and then he realizes uh, underneath her tough as nails exterior, it seems, Jubilee is still just a kid. So he says to her, it's all right, child, everything will be all right. And he goes after Sabretooth on his own, even as the beast is working away, 10 seconds away from a complete meltdown uh, on the Shi'ar energy uh, matrix uh, beneath the mansion. So love this, Bishop is going down to the Morlock tunnels and he's thinking about something that the last time he was in the Morlock tunnels, it was shown back in Uncanny X-Men 287 and he says, every time I'm down here, I can't help recalling the tape I saw before I arrived in this area. Jean Grey's final call for help, betrayed by one of her own. Should never have trusted, she said, we knew so little about. I'd always assumed it was Lebeau. Could she have been referring to Sabretooth? Has he escaped through the tunnels? So a little reference there to the X-Trader subplot, which we haven't heard very much about uh, recently. And so uh, just the possibility, what if it was Sabretooth? What if they trusted that it was possible to keep Sabretooth in the mansion without something like this happening? There he is. This is a great shot by John Romita Jr. of Sabretooth hanging from the roof of the tunnel, about to pounce down on Bishop. But will he get the drop on Bishop? All it takes is a single drop of Victor Creed's blood, a result of his injuries, hitting the water on the floor below him, gives him away. And so Bishop is ready to swing around. Just make sure you can see all of that. And blast Sabretooth right in the chest. So Sabretooth's got to acknowledge, you're good Bishop, a lot tougher than your Mamby Pamby playmates. But Bishop doesn't, doesn't want to talk. Um, so he uh, hits Sabretooth so hard that he gets him right down on the ground. And um, Sabretooth goads him about his devotion to Professor X. Xavier is an idiot, an idealist and an idiot for taking him into the mansion. A bit sensitive about Chuck, are we? You could say that, yes, says Bishop. This great work by John Romita Jr. Huge, huge. Sabretooth just looks so huge. Massive, fantastic work. And then, uh, this is a great moment where um, Bishop says he's not going to kill him because the laws that dictate the here and now, remember what he said earlier, he wants to live in the present, protect you until you're convicted. But Sabretooth just keeps goading him and says, and that's, what, and that's all what's keeping me in one piece. That's mighty nice of you, but I think you're bluffing. I think you ran out of bioenergy. I'm betting you couldn't do nothing to hurt me even if you wanted to. Prove me wrong, kid. Kill me now before I rip off your face. He's getting ready to do it. So is Bishop bluffing or what? Well, Sabretooth gets blasted from behind by Jubilee. He's come down into the tunnel. She's mastered her fear and she's hit Sabretooth with a taser uh, that she found in the emergency locker. And she apologizes for wigging out earlier. And Bishop gives her a hug and says, nonsense, it happens to the best of us. So Beast is out. He stopped the meltdown and um, he's out. He's got sweat on his brow there nonetheless. 
and he says the generators will be online within the hour once we get the toothmonger back and back to his room and check on that slacker bobby drake i'm confident we'll be able to list this in the win column but bobby's out for the count and what has happened to him we'll discover as i said in upcoming issues of the title so then our scene switches to new york city storm was heading into the city to meet an old friend and who is that so the meeting point is a church turned nightclub and she thinks to herself i wonder did she pick this particular spot at random or is it just another example of her peculiar sense of humor for it was not long ago my old friend was key to a similar transformation in me the prim and proper weather goddess shedding my inhibitions and most of my hair to become the leather clad undisputed leader of the x-men sometimes i wonder what exactly i was thinking at the time and that's referenced back to issues 173 to 175 of uncanny x-men she recognizes her from across the crowded bar it's yukio but who are these guys around yukio so they hug um yukio's delighted to see storm and then storm master now if you will tell me what this is all about on the phone he said and then who is this i need to speak to you right away someplace public somebody was listening in on the conversation and yukio thinks uh they said there were triplets all three of them hitting on me at once i thought it was flattering but i should have ex i should have suspected who are these figures look here it's the phalanx and um basically they weren't out for storm uh, they say in a roundabout way we suppose we were but it would only have been after we extracted certain concessions yukio so while storm's appearance here is a pleasant surprise you'll find us well prepared to take advantage of any eventuality and storm concludes by saying my friend in the future should some something like this ever occur again do not be so insistent on meeting away from all the other x-men think mansion great now you tell me says yukio so yukio last appeared in x-book continuity wolverine number 60 and in the next issue we'll learn what it is exactly is her connection with the phalanx here and of course all of this this cliffhanger now is a setup for the story in the next two issues drawn by joe madurera and um even more than that set up for the summer crossover the phalanx covenant so there you go i do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on what turned out to be john romita jr's last issue of his second run on uncanny x-men great art in this and uh on the way uh, another x-men comic superstar joe madurera so i hope that you enjoyed the video if you did please like it in youtube and if you haven't done so already stay uh if you haven't done so already subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.